the, the, the story I want to tell really is a, is a collection of learnings that I've had over this period of time from some amazing people and even more amazing companies. Uh, and in my quest to develop what's turned out to be a fascination for me now, uh, I started this mania for brands and branding and the theory of brands and branding uh, many, many years ago when it, it was still being regarded as somewhat flaky and largely irrelevant and very for the soft-minded. Uh, and of course, what's happened since then is I think as we all now recognize, each one of us is a brand or at least a mini brand in the making uh, and most companies appreciate the value of brands and branding. So it seemed to me to be sensible to try and put together in a basket all of the learnings from, as I say, these amazing people uh, and put it together in a book and in turn condense it in front of you. And I make no apology whatsoever for how simple and basic the rules are. I think the benefit of time and experience means that as you come round the block, uh, instead of making things more and more complex and trying to look clever with it, actually the skill is in trying to simplify it. So I've called it the nine and a half golden rules of branding and I'd like you to come with me back to 1979, somewhat embarrassingly. Uh, I was a 19-year-old callow youth, uh, even more full of myself then than I am now. Uh, and I just started a career in the advertising business. And that first job was at a rather large, or very dull, large American agency called Lintas, who were famous for providing good training and they had big, important clients. And one of the clients that I was assigned to was bird's eye frozen peas. Uh, now, in those days, of course, as fast moving consumer goods in the advertising business, those were the prized accounts because they were the big spenders. Uh, and there I was, age 19, much more taken with the glamour and the excitement of being in what my father considered to be a naughty business, uh, but a slightly vacant head. And wandering down the corridor of that agency one day, I strolled into the planning director, the then planning director's office, to find on his desk a large tome-like manual entitled The Psychology of Frozen Peas. And as this callow 19-year-old youth still struggling to come to terms with the psychology of people, this was too fascinating, so I grabbed it and started to have a quick read. And what it turned out, in effect, was a defense document that the agency was preparing for the bird's eye client in the advance of what was then newly being called own label. And back in those days, own label was a new phenomenon and a very threatening one for the brands. And the story in this document went something along the lines of mothers in the South in particular are very careful what they feed their precious young. Uh, they couldn't care less about their husbands, interestingly, but for the children, it was terribly important. It was slightly different in the North, much better values as far as I was concerned, where the bloke still mattered. But in the South, where brand heartland and premium was important, uh, th this idea that uh, mothers might feed their young second-rate or inferior peas uh, was the very thing that Bird's Eye were trading on. And so this document was this argument about how they could build the defense against the own label by pressing all the points, picked and frozen in two and a half hours, and all the other things that the great bird's eye peas were. And that led me to the first lesson of these uh, nine and a half rules, which is a brand isn't just a nice to have, it really is a genuinely powerful, mission critical, competitive weapon. Now, in 2012, when one looks at that and says, well, yeah, kind of, how revolutionary is that? You would be astonished, I think, the number of companies I go into who haven't yet figured out that a brand is a genuinely powerful competitive weapon. Uh, they, many of them still think it's a bit of a nice to have, and the manifestation of that is that they bung it over to the marketing department to worry about. Mistake number one, but believe me, it's a mistake that's rife. I see it all the time. I got reasonably bored quite quickly at Lintas because they were very proper 
and I felt that I'd done my training, at least in terms of how to set up meetings and all that kind of stuff, and wanted a bit more excitement and a bit more creativity in my life. So I moved, and I went to an agency then called Doyle Dane Burnback, which is still in existence as DDB, although it's transmogrified into other things. Uh, it was the home of the great John Burnback. For any of you who know the advertising industry, he's possibly one of the very greatest uh, stalwarts and names. But he, amongst many things, gave to the world some great sayings like, a principle isn't a principle until it costs you money, um, which I find myself saying very often. Uh, or nothing kills a bad idea quicker than good publicity. Uh, fantastic guy, great agency, uh, and I went there to work on from bird's eye peas to Heinz tomato ketchup, another great iconic thing. Uh, sadly, that my time there was very miserable. Uh, I, I, it was a mistake career move. Uh, I didn't get on with anyone particularly. I was hired by Philip Gould, later to become Lord Gould, who I think in truth was a bit of a fish out of water there and was looking for a kindred spirit, and in me he saw one. Uh, he left not that long after I got there, uh, and so I was left flapping around on my own somewhat. Uh, Heinz one day came to us and said, we're thinking of turning the ketchup bottle into a squeezy bottle. Well, there was absolute consternation in Baker Street where the agency was because we'd spent many years and tens of millions of pounds running commercials on how the Heinz ketchup was the slow one. And we'd had lorry drivers and grannies and kids all bashing the bottom of the bottle based on that Guinness thing about good things come to those who wait. And I'm sure many of you have seen those commercials. And so this outcry went up. It said, you can't possibly put this ketchup in a squeezy bottle. You'll kill everything that we've been doing for many years. The whole brand will go up in smoke. And you'll have wasted the many tens and tens of millions. Well, of course, they went straight ahead and did it. And of course, it became a roaring success. And that gave me the second learning about brands, which is to build a brand, make sure you know the real proposition. It probably isn't what you think it is. There we were, a whole sophisticated agency, arguing fiercely for how they couldn't innovate with their product because ultimately it would ruin the commercials that we'd made about bashing the bottom of bottles. Uh, but, but the simple fact is, of course, that ketchup was always about meal enhancement. Slow was just one delivery method, and here was a new delivery method. And there was a great learning for me, actually, that the proposition may well be lurking somewhere else. And in years to come, I worked with a company called Vax, who make vacuum cleaners. And I'm going to see if I can get through this passage without mentioning Hoover, because it's impossible to talk about hoovering without mentioning hoovering. Uh, but they, their stock in trade was very powerful engines. And they were all about cleaning floors and carpets, deep cleaning floors and carpets, believing that that was the proposition. Our research told us, actually, that most people weren't really that bothered with deep clean. What they wanted was fast clean. And very suddenly, the powerful engines became a support for fast clean rather than deep clean. And we moved them from cleaning floors to brightening homes. Completely different place, much bigger place. They could then launch all their uh, uh, mineral, their, their uh, liquids behind it. It completely opened up their franchise. Again, what seemed like the obvious proposition, which was the engines, actually was something else. It was about brightening homes. The same was true for home base. They came to us and they said, well, we're a DIY shed, can't distinguish from anybody else. And when we examined their research and discovered that actually they had a higher incidence of couples going shopping at, uh, at home base than the other hairy ass ones like B and Q or the others, we very quickly moved them from a DIY shed to a homemaking shop and thus make a house a home, which they're still running now. So the proposition isn't always the obvious thing it might be. And that was a fascinating learning for me about how to think more naturally. 
As I said, I wasn't very happy with, their, uh, with being there. It was compounded by the fact that my mother suddenly contracted cancer. She was on her way out, and the whole period that I was there was like one long, dark winter. And I felt again that it was time for a change. And so I jumped and I joined a new agency called Low Howard Spink. Frank Lowe, now Sir Frank, was one of the original enfants terribles of the industry, uh, mad as a hatter, uh, but brilliant and dangerous to know. Very, very exciting guy. Fantastic offices in Knightsbridge, uh, cool as anything. I'd reached Nirvana. Uh, there were 24 of us when I joined, and the place was absolutely rocking. And I was assigned to the GM, or the Vauxhall Cars account. And after a while, a debate ensued between us and them as to how it was that consumers were buying cars. Now, I think it's probably true for most of us that one says, I drive a Mercedes, and it happens to be an E-Class, and it happens to be the 280, and it happens to be black. And, and that's, that's the sort of cascading order of how people think about and in turn buy cars. Vauxhall, though, because of the way they were structured, had the Astra bit and the Cavalier bit and the absolutely awful Belmont bit, which thankfully has been taken out of circulation, and the other bits that they had. And their entire uh, structure for talking to the universe was, b was based on how they were organized and built internally. And the debate started when we said to them, we don't think people buy Cavaliers or Astras or, God forbid, Belmonts. We think they buy Vauxhalls first and then do the Cascade. And after much toing and froing, they resisted it, but eventually uh, the penny dropped and they bought the argument, and so ensued a Vauxhall, once driven, forever smitten, which was a way of putting together the whole of the Vauxhall story. But that led me to this uh, third very important point. The company structure doesn't define the brand, but the brand can, and in my view, should define the company structure. We, I think, help them see that they should restructure themselves around the way in which people bought their cars, not structure themselves in the way they make them. Uh, very, very important uh, lesson, one that uh, now, years on, I'm doing more and more of this kind of work, uh, and I'm just closing uh, 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 an enormous piece of work with a very large PLC who had bought three other businesses, two of which were nearly as big as they are, and one of the first things they've done is an exercise of this nature to define what is it then that could hold the whole thing together before they, build, they start building the structure of all four businesses. So it's become a four-way merger, which for me is a first. I mean, normally two-way mergers are problematic enough. A four-way one is double the complexity, but it's based on this very thought that we need a proposition in the middle before we can then really properly structure uh, the business. That time at Low House Bink was great. Uh, I'd served my time, I think. Uh, we'd grown from 23 people to 130 people. Tim Bell, now Lord Bell, had joined. Uh, it was fab, but again for me, uh, it was time to move on. And that was uh, uh, exacerbated by the fact that I'd received a telephone call from the ex-creative director at Low House Bink who'd gone to... WCRS, and he was trying to build a team of people at that agency. And he called me one evening, and I went over and had a, what I thought was an innocent drink with him, until he dropped what became a bombshell for me and said, would I come and join them and run this account? Well, in the late 80s, of course, this was beyond the ultimate driving machine, was really the ultimate branding machine, and for anyone remotely concerned with good advertising, or better still, with great branding, there was no higher peak. Uh, and I remember leaving that office in Covent Garden that evening, absolutely skipping on air. I knew something significant had happened to me because being asked to go and work in such exalted company was something, frankly, more than I ever deserved. 
in I went and started to get to grips with BMW. What a fantastic company, what a fantastic brand, what great people they were. Uh, they're every bit as good as you might think they are. And one of the things they were doing in, in that time was, was sponsoring the touring car championship, their, their, their racing cars around a circuit. And they picked up this deal at a bargain price. And it was at a time when not that many people were watching that kind of thing on television. And the inevitable that happens only to BMW, everything they touch turns to gold, the inevitable happened. Suddenly, TV audiences went through the roof. And not surprisingly, they started winning race after race after race after race. And one Monday morning, enthused by this, I went in and we had a meeting with the managing director, Tom Purvis, and I bowled up to him, puppy dog-like, saying, God, it's fantastic, isn't it, Tom? We're just winning everything, isn't it brilliant? And he stopped and said, well, actually, I'm quite alarmed. Oh, why, why might that be? And he said, well, the competition for these things is getting more and more fierce. And as it gets more and more fierce, the drivers are pushing the cars harder and harder. And they're now banging into each other and bits are flying off. It's becoming like stock car racing. And I don't think that's doing our brand any good. We don't need this. We don't need the publicity. We can win in our own way. I was astonished at that. Uh, this innate very diligent sense of how meticulously you have to manage your brand. Not all good publicity, not all publicity is good publicity. Here was the man who, when we would drive around, would want to remove old second-hand BMWs from the street because it tarnished the brand. And here he was saying, we don't need this. We don't need the support of the media. We don't need, we will just win in our own way. And this, this branding is win about winning in your own way actually has formed the bedrock for everything that I believe in, practice, advise, and espouse now, that it really is about getting to understand oneself and then winning according to your own uh, terms, rules, and, and conditions. Uh, and it's for them uh, I'll be eternally grateful. They also taught me, though, that at the heart of every powerful brand in the world is an outstanding product. And I believe there's a very real danger in this open and transparent world where everyone wants to be a brand and it seems relatively easy to become a brand because the channel, media channels are so open to us. This is a fundamental learning that, that people uh, uh, run the risk of. At the heart of every powerful brand is an outstanding product. If you, if you can't get the product right, you ain't got a chance. And they were great at that. During that time at uh, WCRS, we pitched for uh, the BT account, and we won it. Actually, it was the business part, their business to business part. And what ensued for me was a very good relationship with the then director of communications at BT, Adrian Hosford, a fantastic bloke, uh, complete maverick, uh, Irish, glint in the eye, great uh, rule breaker, perfect for corporate world because he just frightened everybody. And well into the relationship, one day he rang me up and said, would I come over and have a drink? And I thought dutifully I would, uh, and I did that evening. And he produced a couple of glasses of champagne, as is his wont, and said very bluntly, had I ever considered jumping the client agency fence and going to work for them at BT? And I'm alleged to have said to him two things, Adrian. Firstly, you'd never find me anywhere for me to park my car. And secondly, why would I want to go and work for a company filled with people wearing gray plastic shoes? Uh, he battered away, rightly, the utter facetiousness of the second remark, said, no, no, don't worry about the car, we'll find somebody. Else. But think about it, it really would be good for you to spread your wings and come and learn what life might be like as a buyer rather than a seller. I, inside, could feel that he was probably right, actually, but there was no way I was going to admit that, not least to myself. I'd never worked outside the agency business, never worked outside a company of 150 people, and there, there was one of 250,000 people. And it was just anathema. I couldn't do it. 
Uh, anyway, off I went that night, rattled, because a little truth bell inside me was ringing that actually if I wanted to stretch and learn, doing it over there uh, might just be the answer. So, of course, the following morning, I rang him up and said, all right then, mate, you're on. I joined BT, uh, glorying in the wonderful title of Worldwide Head of Advertising and Media Quality. It could barely fit on the business card.